there we go it's official um and i think the just worth saying that the usual zoom housekeeping uh, applies uh, we want this to be as uh, participatory as, as it can so as you have questions please do raise your hand or use the chat function and we can come to those um, I'm going to just share my screen so we can see the agenda. Uh, so just one second. Uh, there we go. Okay. So can you see? Um, someone let me know if they can see a slide that says HLP Area of Responsibility Meeting. That's a thumbs up. I see. Great. Yeah, yeah, we can see it. Brilliant. Okay, good. So our agenda today, we're going to hear uh, an update from uh, uh, a recent uh, collaboration that happened between the Mine Action AOR and um, some HLP colleagues as well. Um, and this was um, will be explained by our colleague uh, shortly, but it was a, an initial workshop with Mine Action practitioners and something that we think will be the start of more work going forward together. We're they going to spend some time focusing on the work of the evictions task force in Libya. Um, which uh, we're going to hear from uh, Anna and Richard. They're going to share um, about some of the work they've been doing and developing, and they're really keen to get your sort of reflections, comments, feedbacks, ideas on that. So that's what we're going to spend a bit of time on then. I'm going to give a brief update um, on some of the things that are happening at the global level from the AOR side. Um, and then I think we'll have a uh, an update from the HLP and shelter colleagues um, to be confirmed. And then I want to just hear from all of you if you want to share for a few minutes about what you've been working on. Um, and then if there's any other business that comes up through that process, then we can uh, air that here. And, you know, the, we'll be taking notes from the, the meeting. Um, Johanna, my colleague, is here to do that. So I'm really thankful for her. And we'll be sharing uh, the minutes of this and um, and also recording and any of the links or the documents that come up through the um through the call so um yeah so just want to say again really great to have you here and um i will now pass over to uh, uh roxana a colleague from uh mag who is going to give a brief update on recent work with the mine action hlp aor roxana please you know introduce yourself and uh yeah and share about about our work together i'll just stop sharing the screen one second Hi, Jim. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to this meeting. Um, I am Roxana Boboliku, and I am the International Policy Manager at MAG. Um, let me just see if I can share my screen. I just prepared uh, only three slides. Um, I don't know if you can. Can you see my screen? Yes, we see that one. now. Okay. Um, so yeah, um, MAG supported uh, the HLP and Mine Action AORs um, together with NRC to deliver a um, workshop um, in January this year. Um, the, um, the aim of the workshop was really to enable uh, Mine Action AOR members to learn about HLP and the overlap between the two areas of work and how we can better collaborate with each other. So. Um, it was an opportunity to exchange best practices as well as identify challenges. And uh, there were a lot of challenges uh, as well as uh, some solutions. So it was really great to have uh, more than 50 people um, on each day, both mine action and HLP practitioners um, be able to, to exchange uh, thoughts and compare notes on, on that subject. Because, um, you know, in the mine action sector, we were always aware of the fact that um, clearance can change the value of land and there is potential to lead to property disputes um, but uh, we haven't really systematically uh, integrated HLP considerations in our work as, as a sector so um, really we hope that this was like the beginning of, of a conversation so um, different participants had different level of uh, knowledge so we started with a presentation on some key HLP concepts that uh, Jim kindly delivered to make sure that our mine action colleagues are all on the same page um, and we also had a, um, a presentation from MAG and NRC where the, the two organizations worked together in 2019-20 
to um, systematically integrate HLP considerations across MAG's program in Iraq. And we had um, dedicated donor funding for that project. So it was really um, a really useful example uh, of, of how it can be done in practice. Um, and it was great that we had a lot of participants from very diverse um, contexts. Um, so, you know, ranging from uh, the Middle East to Colombia and Cambodia and Senegal. So um, it was it was a very interesting mix. And we heard very um, different examples of how mine action and HLP can cross over. Um, for instance, just to mention a, a couple of uh, short ones, um, one came from um, Afghanistan, but I think it's, it's uh, happening in other contexts as well, where um, because of um, insecurity of tenure, uh, people don't actually want their land demined because they are afraid of uh, land grabs uh, later on. So that can, can lead to refusal of, of clearance operations or in some more extreme cases, even laying or relaying of, of mines to keep that land undesirable. Um, but we also had interesting examples of where um, you know, risk education is also relevant. Um, I like last week, um, I've met with uh, so, I met with both Helen and. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, in the context of land um, reclamation and uh, refugee returns processes from from Kenya to Somalia, risk education was something that um, was done and uh, but done fairly late in the process. And one of the lessons from from that was that mine action uh, should be integrated early on in in um, returns processes. So, you know, it was an initial conversation, and we had. Um, uh, very broad and diverse experience, very different examples, uh, but some of the kind of recurring um, issues and, and findings that, that came up were um, similar across some contexts. So um, I'll just take you through some of the key findings and then the, the recommendations that um, we came up with, and they do uh, match uh, quite well. So from a mine action perspective, um, tasking and prioritization is really important. That is uh, basically the decision on what gets cleared first, considering uh, how limited our resources are. But that decision is very often done by national mine action authorities uh, with varying degrees of agency from the mine action operators. So one of the um, uh, findings was that we need to find um, a way to raise awareness with mine action authorities to make sure that HLP considerations are taken into account from this initial planning phase. Um, then um, there were particular issues around the practical integration of HLP and community engagement. Um, the mine action sector already does a lot of community engagement and we have these community liaison teams that already do you know, risk education and survey monitoring and evaluation so they go and they already ask a lot of questions so one practical exercise that we need to think of as a sector is how do we review the kind of information that we collect so that we can integrate HLP without making um, the, the whole process uh, to uh, burdensome for, for the teams and, and overwhelming for the communities. Um, another aspect was the long-term impact assessments because we actually, as a sector, we don't really know or we certainly don't have sufficient data to demonstrate if these, um, if land grabs occur on land that we've cleared. And that is because a lot of the impact assessments that we do are, and sometimes by necessity, uh, fairly short term. They tend to be done six to 12 months after clearance because of funding cycles are, are quite limited. So um, there is definitely a need for longer term impact assessments to uh, observe that land use and see if it leads to uh, HLP issues further down the line. Um, and also with regards to limited funding, the other aspect is, you know, integrating HLP as well as um, 
conflict sensitivity more more broadly into operations is a qualitative aspect and that can sometimes be a bit challenging to include in donor proposals when we are often pushed for meters squared of cleared land so um, that is another challenge and finally an issue that is really important across the board is women's property rights um, of course, as mine action actors, we are fairly limited in, in what we can do to, to address that, though there's definitely a lot that we can learn from, from our HLP colleagues, and there is potential opportunity to re-examine the kind of disaggregated data that we collect in, in mine action um, and how that can be used, and also um, uh, potentially referring uh, any issues regarding women's property rights to HLP specialists. Um, so those were some of the key finding and challenges, and then um, they, the recommendations really tried to respond to that. So um, one activity that would be useful is to um, continue to raise awareness. You know, I uh, think it's really important to do that both with practitioners to continue this discussion that, that we've started and to learn uh, from each other. But it's also really important that we raise awareness with national authorities uh, because they are the ones who are, you know, coordinating the process and prioritizing the tasks in, in country. So it's important to do that, but also to raise awareness with donors so that they start um, uh, including more of those qualitative aspects uh, in, in, in proposals um, uh, so that we can um, do more of, uh, of this type of work. And this can be done both at a, an international level through international conferences, but it, it should also be done at a national and potentially regional level. There, there is potential there to explore um, more uh, regional cross-pollination and, and learning because challenges are more likely to be similar uh, in countries from the same region. Um, so yeah, uh, in, in terms of improving um, collaboration, we also had a presentation from um, UNHCR on um, the Global Protection Cluster Community of Practice, and that idea is certainly one that would be useful, especially as we look to learn more from each other, having the um, a forum where people can ask and answer questions on specific topics would be very useful. Um, we want to do a repository of, of resources on the linkages between mine action and HLP. Um, there are already resources on the mine action AOR website, and I believe some on the HLP AOR website as well. So that is definitely a good starting point and something that we'll look to build uh, build upon. Um, there's opportunity to do more partnerships with um, academia. As I mentioned, we don't actually have a lot of data to, to demonstrate um, the uh, impact, the long-term impact of, of, of our mine action work. Um, so there's an opportunity there. And finally, an, an IMAS technical note is something that came up. I don't know if IMAS is something that HLP actors are familiar with. They're the international mine action standards. Um, and uh, technical notes can be produced on, on various aspects of, of mine action. And because they are uh, you know quite a, a key reference for uh, our sector having a technical note an imas technical note would uh, definitely help provide that kind of guidance but would also help put the the right amount of weight to to the subject especially as we look to advocate nope. uh, with national authorities or Wait, donors. Emma? Oui. Uh, um Right, I think that, that was pretty much it. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, we do have a summary report that is almost finalized and will be uh, shared with, with a broad range of stakeholders very soon. So um, yeah, you'll have the opportunity to, to read more about it. But if there are any, any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. Thanks. Thanks so much, Roxana. That's a really great overview. And I think it was um, really clear just where there's a lot of connections to be made and one of the real strong things that came through the opportunity to gather was just that awareness of where do 
we work you know where do hlp actors work where are mine action people working and and how can we collaborate and i think this is part of a sort of a beginning of a of, of more working together so um it was a yeah thank you for all your support in in organizing that it was fantastic to make those connections um and this will be something that will be ongoing i i put a link in the chat to if you want to just sort of sign up to be make sure you're getting the updates around that work we're doing together then please do feel there or just let me know on here um, but yeah, are there any questions uh, for Roxana? Hello, this is Lee Mullaney. I have a question. Do you hear me? Yes, we hear you out. Well, Please go ahead. Roxana, do you know, do you have a kind of idea of the who had ownership of the land before the mines were placed so that um, uh, what was the land used for? in most of these cases um, uh, after the mines were removed. Uh, thanks, Lee. I think, uh, well, that is very context specific. Um, it, it really depends from, you know, in, in some cases, like for instance, in, in Southeast Asia, I know in a lot of places, the government has a lot of control over land uh, so they can actually allocate um, land to to people or to companies uh, and really they uh, have the greatest control over how land is used but that's not necessarily the case everywhere so I think one of the challenges that came up um, in the discussions that we had was exactly that that there isn't necessarily like uh, a one size fits all and uh, from the experience that we had in in Iraq working together with with NRC um, was that we had to like keep going back and refining the the practices and the the way we we engage with communities but um, in in general what we see is that sometimes in many cases some of the most fertile land is uh, contaminated either because uh, of a you know strategic intention to deny access to the opposing forces to the most valuable land or in other cases i know there was a, a study from ohio state university in, in cambodia where actually the most fertile land was likely to be contaminated with explosive ordnance from cluster munitions because when they fell on fertile soil they were less likely to explode than on flinty soil so um that is why I think uh, this discussion between mine action and HLP actors is really important because it, it tends to be, there's no rule and it's very context specific, but it tends to be then in many cases, it's some of the most valuable land, uh, agricultural land that tends to be um, contaminated. And that, that means that there is potential for disputes further down the line. Thank you. Thanks. Anna, you have your hand raised. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Thanks a lot. Um, so my question would be about any lessons learned in terms of um, using this collaboration for stronger government engagement and HLP focused advocacy. Uh, if you also have any any recommendation or any lessons to share on that. Yeah, I mean, I think definitely one of the the first aspects is is ra raising awareness, especially with with mine action stakeholders. Um, obviously, our you know we haven't done this kind of collaboration and advocacy extensively, but I think there is um, potential to learn more from each other about what different kinds of government stakeholders we each engage, because there are also stakeholders that are responsible for the property rights, basically. So, um, you know, I, I don't really want to pre preempt a lot of legwork that needs to, to be done there, but there is maybe potential to um, connect the dots between the, the mine action governmental stakeholders and uh, and those that are relevant for, for HLP issues to make sure that uh, when clearance is prioritized, we know exactly how, uh, how that land is, is going to be used and, and what potential there is for um, issues further down the line. Thanks. Yeah, and I think that's something we're looking at how we can best develop and work out what the, the next steps are for that one, aren't we? OK, uh, so um, just final question, I'm afraid, just because of our, our time. But um, Gabrielle, I see your hand raised. Please ask, ask your question and then we'll. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, mine is not a question, but just to comment, uh, because uh, mine action and the NRC also did similar research in South Sudan in 2013 
look near to the uh, land access after when the land uh, land mines have been cleared. Uh, so they did the research in one of the county called uh, Lanya Kant in Central Equatorial State. And uh, there were a lot of issues. Uh, one of the colleagues asked a person that was there any specific ownership issues or disputes. And it was actually found out that in that particular area, uh, when land was cleared, the rightful owners were trying to come back and they wanted their land. But the government said, look, we cannot have this land because we don't know what is still there. Maybe there could be still some remnants of uh, landmines and this land will uh, be under government. So there is that kind of controversy, but I think uh, that the research was important and it actually uh, informed a lot of issues before HLP and the line, uh, landmine was looked at as a separate thing. But through that research, uh, we were able to really learn a key lesson that uh, there is the interface between the two, when it, especially when the clearance happens and the uh, handover of the land back to the owners, always there is HLP issues. And it is important to kind of uh, work closely uh, uh, to, yes. to achieve that uh, with the HLP technical, uh, maybe working group or HLP uh, area of uh, responsibility uh, to handle such issues. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, my colleague, for the wonderful presentation. Thanks, Gabrielle. Yes, I mean, that makes the point really well, that it's about how do we see these sort of collaborations better integrated rather than working in our separate areas and i think that's something we're we're interested to think how we can do best um so yeah please would love to you know hear your suggestions comments ideas for for that work and um um and yeah thank you uh, roxana for for um work. also i just say gabrielle if you have any reports or documents from that that work together please do share them and we can include them in our repository um, yeah, to, definitely. To... I will say it with you. I have with me right now as she was presenting. I was also looking at you. Brilliant. I will Excellent. share with you after this. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. And the same goes to everyone else as well. So, Roxana, thanks so much for joining us. And um, yeah, look forward to keeping our, our collaboration going. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Take care. Bye. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and I just before we move on to the next um, thing, I just wanted to mention um, Ukraine briefly, because I imagine for most of us, it's been, um, you know, part of our, our sort of awareness, but also maybe featuring as part of discussions and, and meetings in terms of how on earth do we respond to what's going on there and, and what's happening. And just to say that from the HLP AOR side, we over the years have been supporting and working with um, the HLP technical working group there. Um, and they've been focused a lot on uh, sort of compensation issues and, and issues around um, people losing their homes that are being used by military at various uh, points in the, the sort of ongoing conflict from the last seven or eight years there. Um, and they've been thinking a lot around durable housing, sort of return, integration, resettlement. And, um, and so I think, at the moment, of course, we don't know what's what's going to unfold over the next few weeks, and um, we're sort of, you know, really th thinking a lot about colleagues who are there, um, and and all those people who are often being displaced. But I think there's going to be a need to um, work on those same sorts of issues: compensation, uh, return, uh, restitution that we work in in so many cases. But but that's something we'll be starting to look at how we can uh, respond to over the coming months. Uh, when that becomes uh, more relevant. So um, again, let us know if you'd like to be involved in part of those, those conversations. Um, I think there's so much experience and knowledge on, on restitution and compensation and, and, and how those processes work in this group. Um, and it'd be great to start thinking about how we can support colleagues and people there who will, will very much need that. Um, okay, so now we're going to turn to our colleagues in, in Libya. Uh, so I'm really pleased to have with us today uh, Richard Evans, who's the uh, Shelter Cluster Coordinator, sorry, Shelter and NFI Sector Coordinator within uh, Libya and with UNHCR. And we also have Anna Maria Geller, who's the Libya Protection Sector Co-Coordinator, and she's with DRC. So I um, want to hand over to uh, 
uh, Rich and Anna, who are going to talk to us about the work of the eviction task force there. Um, something that's been sort of developing some sort of tools and processes and, and responding to what's what's going on. Um, so yeah, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so many thanks for inviting us again, because we already had the opportunity to discuss with uh, in this forum, uh, the idea for the eviction task force at its very beginning. Uh, so now we are happy to, to give you an update on the progress we've made, but also use this opportunity to pick your brain on some of the questions that, uh, that we are facing a year down the line. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, just to recap that the eviction task force was uh, set up by the protection and uh, shelter and FI sectors in January 2021. Uh, we have the same group of uh, core partners um, and many thanks to, to them for, for their contribution to our work. So I know some of them are on the line with us today, uh, but we also do engage with other actors on ad hoc basis, depending on the specific situation we are dealing with, uh, such as OCHA or, or other organizations and NGOs working in a specific areas. Uh, and when we developed the TOR for the eviction task force um, over, over a year ago, we wanted this group to work specifically on certain tools and guidance that could be then taken by, by partners or other coordination mechanisms and use when responding or addressing eviction issues. Um, and we had three main type of outputs, so um, related to advocacy, related to operational guidance, um, so how to program and how to respond, and then to information management, and we'll also touch base on um, or provide you with a detailed overview of those in a moment. Uh, but we also wanted to mention a bit about the rationale for, um, for the eviction task force. Uh, so if I can ask for the next slide. Uh, contextually, um, in Libya, we are dealing with a situation where HLP concerns are growing as the stabilization process continues. It's actually a bit of a flip side of, of a quite positive um, development in the situation when we talk about internally displaced people. We see evictions which are related both to, to pressure or expectation of returns, uh, but also related to individual private owners uh, reclaiming property. Uh, maybe I will mention just one of the features of, uh, of displacement in Libya is that there is a relatively small number of people residing in collective sites and spontaneous settlements, and a lot of them are actually renting property or living in um, an abandoned building. Uh, but we've also observed in the last month uh, a deterioration of the situation of migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers in several urban areas. Since July, we've seen mass expulsions um, of, uh, of non-Libyans. Um, and this also impacted their ability to enter the, the rental market. But operationally also, the reason for why we set up the eviction task force is that we don't have an HLP AOR. And um, to be also very honest, our, um, the resources among our partners to, to work on HLP issues are limited to uh, very few partners. So the response to evictions is spread across the protection sector, shelter and apply sector and the cash and market working group. Uh, but we, as we do, or a relatively small response, we don't have subnational clusters, but we do have regional area coordination groups, which are actually also meant to, to carry forward the, um, the operational side of the response. Uh, in addition, um, in terms of the coordination architecture, this is quite challenging for us because um, both the uh, sector coordinators, but also many of our NGO partners are facing um, issues uh, in terms of uh, receiving visas. So to a large extent, the coordination uh, is done remotely and uh, so is also um, to a large extent the, the response. Um, we've seen a visa suspension for several months now in, in Libya. Um, so all this leads us to the question about roles and responsibilities and um, how can the eviction task force, what should be its role? Uh, how can we leverage uh, maybe um, more, more direct presence of some of our partners um, in the coordination architecture? Uh, and I'll hand over now to, to Richard to also tell you a little bit more about the products that we have developed uh, in the last year. Thanks. Richard, we don't yet hear you. Just in case you're muted. Yes, uh, Jim, you set the you set the trend to do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, so the task force has produced five um, products which work together as a suite. Uh, the first one we did was key messages, which sets the common position for all of us. It was endorsed by the Intersector Coordination Group and shared within the HCT. Now, in Libya, we don't have a, a CCCM sector. So we took that gap and said, well, we need to have information about all the settlements that we have. And so we produced a very standard document there. But I think what is perhaps more interesting is something that we did was the eviction threat yesterday. index. I'm just, uh, I've got someone uh, in the background. Yeah, we did the eviction, the eviction threat index, which looked at a, an array of parameters and helped us try and prioritize which of these settlements and which areas were most likely to be evicted so that we could concentrate, as Anna says, our limited resources. So that was a, a unique uh, a development uh, to us. The next piece that we did was what we're calling the eviction tracker. And now this is a Kobo based tool and it allows partners um, and a vast array of them to enter data that they see about an eviction. Um, we've trained over 50 colleagues um, from um, feedback helplines to, to um, you know, frontline field workers in how to fill out this form. The tracker has two parts to it. The first one helps us respond because we get notification that someone has done, a done a, an entry and then our SOP says we have to do something within 48 hours, a referral or take it to the larger eviction task force group. But it also allows us to get a, a, a handle on what's going on, the broader picture. And as you can see from these dashboards, we've got 97 submissions so far. And again, this is how all the products work together. This then allows us to feed that back up into those key advocacy messages by looking at trends, who's getting evicted, where they're getting evicted, and what are the circumstances around those evictions. The next product that we did was try to get as practical as we can, because we saw in evictions, particularly the big ones, it can be very chaotic. And we wanted to make sure that there were no gaps and there was no overlay between different partners. So we, we listed out 17 possible activities that you could do, and we split them over the four different categories, as you can see um, on the screen. Um, and that allows us, Anna and I, and the, the task force as a coordination body to clearly assign tasks. You do this, you do that, you do this. And they can see how everybody's working together. A little bit of a function of, of Libya because we are a small um, humanitarian response. And so we need to work together. It's also acting as a tool library, as a depository for all that information like um, needs assessments, uh, stakeholder analysis, so that we don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. The last thing that we've done is the actual, okay, we're having an eviction. So let's, uh, let's make sure we are there. We are physically on there to, to monitor that. And we have a checklist on that. And that's very much based on the uh, HLP AOR's dignified departure. So I'm just going to leave you with a couple more thoughts on the product side of things. First one, I just want to I just want to make it clear that the eviction task force we cover all eviction cases, whether they're singles, multiples, or mass evictions. We cover all that information together, and we can then disaggregate it accordingly. And we're also talking about the full caseload that we deal with in Libya. So it's IDPs um, and I guess returnees as well, and I guess host population but mainly IDPs, refugees, and the migrant population. And the other bit of learning that we've had from this is it's all very well to create these tools, as we all know, um, and, and to set them up, but there's quite a lot of maintenance and upgrading that needs to be done. So it's, it's about keeping that whole process going and making sure all the different products speak to each other in the correct way. So that's what we produced. Now I'm just going to hand over to Anna because she has some questions for you guys. So we wanted to use this opportunity to also ask you for your um, advice and uh, thoughts on a few questions. Uh, I think the one we are that is most um, critical to us now is uh, what do we do next with the eviction task force? As mentioned initially, TOR was set to develop this uh, suite of tools. 
um, and uh, hand them over to, um, to certain um, existing coordination mechanism or bodies or actors uh, to, uh, to implement them. But as Richard mentioned, we, we do see a need to keep them uh, maintained uh, and we do feel some sense of ownership. So we are wondering uh, in this context, uh, where, what should we do next with, with the eviction task force? Should we uh, transition and try to transition into an HLPAOR? Should we keep it? Should we look at uh, other coordination mechanisms or should we identify maybe a partner who can take lead on that? Um, and then we also wanted to go a bit uh, further into uh, your experience on uh, engaging directly um, on advocacy uh, and how we could do that in, uh, in the context of remote management and uh, yeah, in our remote presence. Uh, especially as uh, as coordinators who uh, who should also take the risk of advocacy on not uh, necessarily easy issues away from from the partners who were implementing the response, um, and then also a question on uh, whether you think the tools that we've developed for Libya and uh, but also to be very very honest, we sometimes feel that uh, are maybe too complicated for the scale of um, uh, of needs that we are dealing with. But could they be applicable for, for other contexts and uh, how? Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Richard. So there we go. We have some really clear, good questions based on a really clear, good presentation around what's been developed, what they're responding to a little bit. And, and then, yeah, this moment now of having develop some tools, got it working, what then happens next? And I, I know for a fact there are people on the call who have got really good experience uh, working in, um, in, in various contexts, but where evictions are one of the, the key kind of protection issues or the key HLP issues that, that come up and that you're dealing with. So I'd just really love to hear some thoughts from people. So you can either address one of these questions you can address all of them at once. You can ask a question. Um, but yeah, whilst you're all thinking of those, I'll just pass to John, who has his hand raised. Thanks, can you hear me? Yes, hear you well. Great. Um, uh, really like the, the presentation. There's a, there's a great deal there. Um, uh, a, a, number, a couple of things um, that I think that can maybe be built off of the great work that you've done so far. Um, uh, post eviction, of course, we have uh, broadly the, the problem of what happens to that HLP um, uh, going forward. Uh, ideally, we would like uh, at some point restitution to take place, but evictions can take place for a reason. And, and a big reason there is to uh, sell on that HLP or, or transfer ownership uh, elsewhere. So you have a secondary occupant, you, you essentially are, are trafficking in it. We have seen though that with increased visibility of, uh, of an eviction, an illegal eviction, in other words, that, that there, there's a, a problem with a property that decreases the prospect that um, a legal transaction will, will take place. So, so it acts as a, uh, a break, if you will, on being able to sell that that HLP and thus sort of um, increasing the prospect of, of uh, restitution. So I've actually seen this in a, in a number of, of conflicts. Um, and so where, where there's uh, been confiscations, evictions, expropriations, once it becomes visible, even internationally, that there's a problem with a, even a specific HLP that really puts the brake on uh, selling that on. Uh, so, so ultimately, of course, you need a good faith purchaser who assumes that their purchase is going to be permanent in order for them to pay for it in the first place, in order for there to be, to be a market in this expropriated HLP. So by making it very visible that there's a problem with a specific HLP, you actually put the, the brake on that and making restitution easier. One thing I, I was thinking about your your um, eviction tracker, excellent, is that you could use it for that, okay? You could, you could use the eviction tracker to, to make it visible. And one thought would be, in addition to, of course, supporting the notion for creating a, a, an AOR in Libya, I think that'd be a great idea, would be to maybe uh, elicit the support of other international actors in, in making visible uh, the evictions. 
specific evictions that are that are taking place in uh, in in Libya in order to kind of up the visibility aspect of it as as a tool uh, to uh, to make the, the road toward restitution uh, earlier. And I'll just uh, uh, sort of end this with a question I have. I wasn't really clear on uh, how did the information get gets into the tracker. Is it the individual HLP owner who has been evicted? Are they uploading their information directly into the tracker or is it someone doing it on their behalf? I wasn't really clear about that. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, Anna, Richard, would you like to respond to, well, either the <laughs> comments and or the question at the end? Anna, Anna can respond to the comments, um, but I can do the easy bit. And yeah, no, um, John, it's done by uh, either someone going to the house and visiting. So it's done by an international partner or a local partner, or it's done by people phoning up a, a helpline. And then the person on the other end will fill it in. So it's not a self-reporting system. It's, it's reported by others. Um, Anna, do you have any thoughts on, on, the, on the comments? Sure. Um, so in terms of the uh, of the dashboard, uh, we do intend to um, to make it publicly available uh, when aggregated at uh, Mantika level, which is admin level three. Uh, so we did have recently uh, some discussions with the partners whether this uh, creates any risks, but um, the the decision is to um, to go ahead with uh, with this level of aggregation. We probably uh, will start uh, slowly by sharing it with different um, actors who are either part or are linked to the humanitarian response before we uh, post it on uh, maybe on public uh, websites that are frequently visited, uh, just to see if there is any uh, there is any risk. I think the Libya response is quite risk aware when it comes to to sharing information and sharing data. So we also don't want to. Uh, endanger um, the trust and collaboration with partners we already have. But we definitely did already um, started discussions about how we can use the dashboard and the information that comes from the eviction tracker to, um, to boost a bit our advocacy products and make them more context specific. So even if we wouldn't necessarily be keen to send in the uh, link to the dashboard to the different municipalities, uh, we could definitely um, have a one pager with some with some key analysis points and uh, and start from there. Thank you uh, both. Thank you, uh, John, as well for your comment. Um, I'll go to uh, Deliani next, and uh, and then also just want to highlight. There's a question in the chat um, uh, asking if anyone has experience using the reparations framework as a remedy or deterrent in cases of forced eviction as classified as a gross violation in international law. And I believe that's from uh, Joseph. So um, yeah, have a think about that and if, see if that's something that is relevant. And maybe uh, Joseph, I'll come to you later if, if, if we need a little bit more uh, explanation. But um, uh, Deliani, over to you. Oh, and please uh, also do introduce yourself in terms of where you're working and, and uh, your context, thanks. I can't hear you just now. I don't know if you're muted. Sorry. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Deliani. I'm co-chair of the HLPAUR in Mozambique. I was just wondering uh, about on this tracker, when you have all, all this data and uh, we know exactly what caused the evictions, um, what, how can we do uh, to prevent them? I mean, for the, in terms of security of tenure, uh, could we, in ba t um, having this, this data, that, uh, that cause these evictions. Can we do anything to uh, prevent uh, these evictions in terms of secure of tenure and in the context uh, that you are working? So I think that's yeah. a question. Yeah, sorry, go on, Richard. Yeah. You... No, very, um, yeah, very, very good question. What's the point in collecting all this if we can't do anything? Uh, I've just gone back to the, um, to the graphic. I don't know if you can see because it's small print, but it's big on my screen. Down the bottom right hand corner, you've got some numbers. Basically what that's saying is um, out of all the events that we get, we have tried to do an intervention in 18% in of them. 
So we've got the reports in time and we have a partner who is ready and the partner has gone and tried to um, change the course of that eviction. So that's one in five. And then one in five again, so 23% of those we've actually been successful. So we've managed to renegotiate or we've managed to find a, a way if it is a payment issue. Um, so we've managed to... Yeah, we've managed to, sorry, Adam is the other side of the office, has given me hand signals, um, but we've managed to do it. So, uh, yeah, so we are, we are trying to get um, involved where we, where we possibly can, but it's, again, it's, it's some of the context of Libya. I would imagine if we were in a different context, we both worked in Somalia before, where you can physically get to a lot more sites, then I think we could actually increase those numbers. Is that all right, Deli Ali? Deli Ali? This is perfect. Thank you so much for this answer. Thanks. That, I mean, that would be really interesting to hear if others have, um, you know, experience of that, that being able to you know, essentially intervene between understanding that there's a threat and then being able to help prevent that. Um, are other people who've been working in different contexts? Um, Somalia was mentioned there. I know others have been working on these issues in many places. So, uh, do you have, have experience of being able to um, link the threat being reported to then actually being able to uh, do something to stop it. It'd be great to hear examples where people have been doing that. Um, and um, also, I mean, I, I, the question on coordination is a good one, an interesting one. Um, do people who work on evictions, do they find that that work fits well with, uh, within the protection cluster, uh, within the you know, uh, HLP working group or AOR structure? Or have they seen it work in other ways, either with a, uh, maybe a, a national or local partner or, or another agency or, or actor taking that on? Um, please be, be free and share your <laughs> comments and ideas because we really want to hear from you. Um, or you can put it in the uh, chat as well if you would prefer, but it'd be good to hear, hear some experiences. Um, I'll pause for a minute and see if anyone has anything to say. Fatih, please. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Um, no, thanks for the presentation. Um, it made me think a lot on some of my experiences as well, working in Somalia and some of the things that have helped because <clears throat> that's also a country context that really deals with forced evictions as one of the main violations of HLP. Um, and what we found that worked a lot too was really getting the local authorities involved and making sure, especially depending on where we were tracking some of these evict um, evictions, a lot of them were happening on informal settlements. Um, and so it was really important to make sure that the local authorities um, were involved. And at that time, the BRA was also developing a durable solutions task force um, and <clears throat> even working with communities directly to make sure that they had awareness over their rights and how to advocate for their rights if they felt that there was an eviction um, impending. And interestingly enough, some of the things that we found too is as we were trying to um, work on this type of advocacy is a lot of times the accountability part is challenging because it becomes difficult to kind of determine um, who the landlord is. It's a context where there's a lot of gatekeeping, especially with um, large plots of lands that are then used for either refugee resettlement or for displaced persons. And um, it was just really difficult because you, reala you realize like, who do you hold accountable? And then you realize that you're not even really dealing with the actual property owner half the time. And so, kind of unraveling some of these layers um, was a bit helpful in getting um, authorities also involved and kind of coming up with unique ways. We also just worked on, um, even outside of Mogadishu, on creating pamphlets that had information on accessible ways of using the different forms of legal mechanisms that were in place. Um, and kind of just having a lot more awareness. I mean, obviously it didn't stop the um, occurrences of forced evictions completely, but it wasn't at the peak that we saw um, in previous years in 2018, 2019. Um, so yeah, I'll end there. And I realized I didn't introduce myself. So I'm Fatih Egal and I am a land and conflict analyst for UN Habitat's GLTN, Global Land Tool Network. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Sarah Richard, I don't, uh, sorry, Anna uh, Richard, I don't know if um, 
uh, that links with local authorities is something that you're able to you know, pursue and develop with, with maybe with partners on the ground or is that something that's even possible? So maybe I'll comment on that. Um, this is something ideally we would really like to do. The challenge for us is that um, not being in Libya most of the time or um, is, is creating a, obstacles to, to build these relations that would help us then to touch on the more sensitive issues. Um, so we are also wondering how we can do that in, uh, in a situation where, uh, where we are not really there and uh, how much of that um, can we transfer to, to selected partners? How much of that can we request partners to who are um, in Libya? Um, how much of that risk actually can we expect them to, to accept? Thanks, Anna. Um, yes, and so, sorry, I just saw another question uh, come in and it distracted me. I'm quite easily distracted. This is the problem with these multiple things going on, isn't it? Um, some people seem to surf it very smoothly and I'm a bit more obvious. Um, anyway, so a couple of questions and comments just coming in. Um, so we have that, that question from Joseph about if does anyone use the uh, reparations framework? So that'd be interesting to hear from anyone if that's something that they've, they've looked at. And, and Joseph, if you want to comment a little bit more on that, please, please do. Um, Laura suggesting sort of potentially establishing an HLPOR or technical working group, but partly to sort of broaden out the scope of uh, dealing with HLP issues. So um, yeah, of course, eviction will be part of that, but that might be something that, that we could go. And of course, we're here to support that process. And uh, um, uh, yeah, I understand it. It requires steps and uh, commitments and all that sort of thing, but it'd be good to discuss that if that's applicable. Um, and um, I have a, a question, I think, yes, it's a question from Ahmed. Um, so as Libya is more controlled with the clan system, is there a methodology to engage with the leaders of of the tribes, tribes. Okay. sorry, yeah. I see, yeah, to, to face the forced <laughs> eviction for refugees and displaced persons. So, yeah, so a couple yeah, of comments that, over to you. Sure, uh, I mean, Ahmed, absolutely, um, as, you, as you rightly point out, Libya is a very tribal, very clan, very militia-based um, operations, and that's certainly something that we do. The militia around an informal settlement is very much a controlling factor and very much a stakeholder in any eviction process. And, and as, as you'd see, in, if you looked at our 17 activities around what you would do in terms of eviction, interfacing with them is key to it. Um, and then I just want to go back to, to Lara, uh, Lara's comment. Absolutely. We, interesting you should say that because we felt that we were a little bit out on a limb with the eviction task force. Nobody likes a, a second layer of coordination structures. There's enough of them already, so why create a new one? So we actually tried to move towards a HLP o, a AOR. Um, and as you say, not only to broaden out the topic, but also to give us a little bit more of a place within the architecture. Um, our request was turned down um, on that one, um, but I do think it's something we should think about again, particularly when we see another round of evictions coming up. So yeah, no thanks for maybe giving us the, the encouragement to, to ask again. Good, and I'll follow up with you as well and we can uh, uh, pursue that conversation a little bit more. Be good to hear more. Um, Hand raised now, Rania. I think that might be uh, Joseph. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Hi. Um, uh, thanks. I um, I assume that you're posing a question to me to explain a little bit about this. Um, in the in the field work on forced evictions, uh, and in the you know the human right to adequate housing and all the work that's gone on globally, not necessarily. In the, con on, in the context of conflict, um, this uh, reparations framework that has taken so long to work its way through the, uh, the Commission on Human Rights, eventually the Council, and, and then to the General Assembly, has been really key 
uh, as a legal argument uh, against forced evictions and forced evictions meaning illegal evictions that don't follow the general comment number seven criteria for a lawful eviction, uh, those are subject to reparation, which is a, a, a package, a bundle of entitlements. And this is kind of a lawyerly question, a law lawyerly issue, but for those who are working in the UN system, this is definitely a tool that is applicable. But uh, I just wonder to what extent people are aware of it and, and if it's, if it's uh, used or could be useful in the field, especially to uh, remedy these things, because it's clear in international law what the entitlements are. It's not only restitution, it's, it's rehabilitation and, and compensation and uh, you know, seven different elements, uh, but also as a deterrent, because there are so many entitlements that must be understood uh, for the victims of forced eviction. Uh, that that perhaps this could be persuasive for governments, local authorities, for example, uh, to dissuade uh, forced evictions from taking place in the first place. Thanks. So that sounds like a, a, a sort of a key um, pillar potentially in the sort of advocacy approach that one might take to raise that awareness um, across all <laughs> to, to understand the consequences of, of these illegal evictions that might be do something to actually act as a deterrent. Um, yeah, yeah. thank you for, for clarifying that. That's really helpful. Um, did, Richard, Anna, did you want to come back on that? Um, whilst you're thinking about that, I'll also say um, uh, just a, a note in the chat, um, just uh, uh, sort of highlighting that clarifying the land ownership starting the formal land registration system and reforming it to become more fit for purpose and responsive to the needs of current Libya will be essential precondition to address forced evictions in a sustainable manner. So yeah, so that's from uh, Operetta with uh, UN Habitat and GLTN, uh, that you know, there's that emergency response to what's happening and then there's that longer term, uh, more structural uh, uh, work that's needed as well. Um, and something to think about how those things uh, connect. And maybe that goes back to the the question as well about sort of some kind of HLP working group AOR that can build those links with the longer term responses. Um, okay, well, thank you um, for your questions and comments, uh, everybody. Um, please do continue to add comments and questions in the chat if you would like. Um, and I just want to sort of say at this, this point, thank you so much, uh, uh, Richard and Anna, for um, sort of approaching me and, and you know being keen to, to do this and uh, uh, the discussions we've had around this have been really interesting. And th the invite goes out to all of you. If there is a, a something you're thinking about, uh, work that you're doing that you want to get some perspectives on, um, it might be that you're considering what next, um, you'd want to draw on the experience of others, please do propose, uh, get in touch um, and uh, let's you know, see what we can do. Richard, you have your hand raised. Yeah, just to just to say um, thank you. Thank you very much, Jim, and thank you for all the, um, all the comments. Um, um, and I, I'm just picking up on that self-reporting one, and I think that would be a nice step to go as the next one, is that people could report their own evictions, that they don't need us. Anyway, uh, all many of those resources are on our website, um, and I will put it up um, in the chat. Um, but if anyone wanted to get any more, please contact Anna or myself, and we can talk you through it and give you some of the, the, the real insights behind it. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks very much, Jim. Anna, do you want to have a final word? Thanks a lot. Um, not much to, to add. Feel free to reach out and uh, we'll be happy to share um, the whole scope of our lessons learned uh, and many things for sharing great ideas for us to consider in the future. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks both of you. And uh, and just to say as well, you know, I, I often talk about these thematic working groups and interest groups that we have, and one of them is around evictions and relocations. Um, currently, the people who were leading that are no longer in their positions, so we have uh, sort of openings. So if someone is feeling uh, galvanized, motivated to um, sort of draw together uh, really uh, keen sort of individuals who are working on these issues to sort of develop some plans and uh, look at some activities or, or even just to create a forum for sharing the most sort of cutting edge work that's being done on this, then um, please do let me know because it would be great to uh, see you. 
uh, active in that and I'd be available to support on a kind of logistics and administrative side as well so I'm not going to just push you out there and leave you having to deal with all sorts of things so if that's something that would be of interest please let me know and um, I will be emailing all the people on that list currently to, to see as well um, but but yeah thanks so much uh, Anna Richard um, that was that was that was really interesting really good um, okay so we have uh, a scheduled 28 minutes uh, left so I'm going to um, offer some uh, updates just from the global AOR side just some of the things that we've been doing um, before I do that uh, a couple of comments and um, updates around um, yeah just on the sort of broader scale so I'm pleased to introduce uh, Jamal Brown so he is uh, works with UNHCR. Now UNHCR and, and the AOR have, have worked closely over many years as, as with numbers of other of you as well um, and uh, have been missing uh, an HLP focal point for a little while. So it's great to have uh, uh, Jamal uh, now with us, uh, working with us. So Jamal, would you like to introduce yourself and uh, um, yeah, say hello and yeah, some of the things that maybe have caught your attention so far? Yes, um, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, you know, I, I truly do appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this conversation today. Um, very enriching so far. You know, um, one of the things that I really appreciate from what I've really gathered from the conversation thus far is the fact that it's, it's really not academic in any way. It's very much grounded in reality, and um, it goes far beyond the normative. And I think that's, that's very important in light of the many challenges that we're currently faced with. I think that is incredibly important. You know, um, having not been a part of this particular grouping um, at any point in time, you know, my, I, I, I wasn't certain as to what to expect coming into this conversation. But based on what I've gathered thus far, something special is happening here. And I truly do look forward to being a part of these conversations going forward. You know, just being able to, to go outside of that sort of academic type of conversation, the rudimentary conversations on HLP, and, and going down to country level, identifying what the real issues are, and really seeking to, to develop solutions, sharing best practices, um, um, coping mechanisms from the ground, I think that is absolutely critical. So we, we merge the, the academic, we, we merge the global normative perspectives that we have with actual in-country experiences, real experiences on the ground. And, and this is a place where the magic really happens. So Jim, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you all for, for having me. I truly do look forward to being a part of, of, of this space, to be an engaged in this space going forward. Over to you, Jim, thank you. Thanks, Jamal, so that's great. We look forward to lots of uh, fruitful collaboration with, uh, with UNHCR continuing um, as, as, we, as we go. Um, okay, I'm just gonna share my screen. I just wanna share a couple of uh, updates with you. Um, great, so I, I'm assuming, can you see someone say yes or no in terms of can they see the yes. agenda? Yes, excellent, thank you. Um, great, so I um, want to just give a, a little bit of an update on some of the things that are going on um, and highlight some uh, just, yeah, things that might be of interest and um, yeah, keep you informed. Um, so the first thing to say is that, you know, one of the things the AOR exists to do is act as a, as a help desk. Um, uh, a little bit like the Libya example, where if people are facing particular challenges or, or, or issues, it can be technical issues, it can be to do with coordination, it can be just general questions on how to engage with HLP. And that's something that's a real priority for us to be here to respond to. And it's something that for this year and the next couple of years, we're looking to uh, develop and expand more, to have a bit more of a regional focus around how we do that. Um, and an initial thing that's happened is that we are you know, continuing to expand the roster of HLP experts. So that's, you know, you and your colleagues who are willing to be, as it were, on call for when uh, something comes up and we can convene a group of people to discuss what's happening, maybe bring some ideas, some perspectives, some solutions. Um, so 
we've previously you know done this on a number of different uh, areas and we've recently um, added some more people who are uh, with expertise on displaced women's HLP rights to that list. Would love to see more people involved like with experience around returns and restitution and durable solutions. These are things that keep coming up, keep being asked about. And um, so if, you, if you'd be interested in being on, on that list, then please do let me know. It's not a big commitment. It's that when things come in and there's um, requests come in, we can convene a group of interested people to support and you know workshop talk through um, ideas so that's one thing we're we're sort of pushing on and it's been great to see that expanding over the last couple of months um i mentioned in my initial email that um as well as these um sort of global quarterly meetings we're setting up a, a sort of a bi-monthly update so that's basically a space where um those of you working on HLP issues can just just share what you're doing. So it's a very an informal space, uh, kind of a peer to peer exchange um, for sort of coordinators, co coordinators, those that are working in HLP working groups or or, or whatever it is. Um, and it's 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 to you know to be able to encourage each other to to share what's happening, what's working well, what isn't. So um, what we will do is we will have um, those every couple of months. And there will be an open space for you to bring bring what you're working on, and um, we'll we'll see how that goes. Um, I think it could be something that could be quite useful, but I I don't know until we try. So we will we will try that and see 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 what what happens with that. Um, on that uh, perspective, we're also um, I've mentioned again before wanting to support and work better with uh, our francophone colleagues, colleagues that are working predominantly in French. Um, and uh, that's something that you know we need to be better at, and we're we're looking at um, uh, sort of developing our work on that. Um, Tina, would you just share a little bit about the uh, upcoming uh, meeting that we propose? Uh, yes, thank you, Jim. So this is Tina. I'm with the Norwegian Refugee Council, um, based in Dakar, as the uh, ECHA advisor for Western Central Africa. And knowing that we have a lot of French-speaking operations in our region. Um, and that also means some particular dynamics around H uh, HLP that are specific to our region. We want to create a forum of exchange. So uh, due to some scheduling difficulties at my end, we have not been able yet to organize the first meeting in 2022, uh, as we had earlier planned. But we're now looking at early April, at the 6th of April, and we'll be reaching out very soon to the group of all colleagues involved with HLP, AORs, and working groups in Central and West Africa to agree on the date and the exact agenda for this upcoming meeting. Uh, so this is something that Jim and I will be facilitating. Thank you. Thanks, Tina. So that's the 6th of April we're proposing for that, but we will be sending uh, communication around about that around. Okay, so something else I want to highlight is that um, for a number of you, this will be very relevant, for some of you less relevant, but the uh, Global Protection Cluster, um, as, as you probably know, has a, a, a two sort of forums <laughs> that happen during the year. We have the uh, kind of a thematic forum that tends to be in September, October, and we have a discussion around particular topics and the AOR has, has worked with you on some really interesting uh, events for that. Another part of the, the forum is, is around the technical support to those of, of us that are coordinating and supporting that work um, in responses. So for this year, it's been proposed that the uh, technical forum will happen in a, in a, a regional level. Um, so that's to, to encourage sort of better operational focus and increasing focus on, on the context within which they're working. And there's going to be sort of three main priorities around that. Um, uh, field coordination package, um, protection analysis and information management, and then collective protection advocacy. Um, and then there'll also be space for specific sessions that are relevant to that region. So as an AOR, we're invited to join those, those events and they will be a mixture of in-person and online. Um, you may well have received the emails, hopefully already. If not, do let me know and I'll make sure you do. Um, but as you can see, there's the dates there uh, for, there's uh, Istanbul, Dhaka, uh, Nairobi and Bogota for the different regions. So that's just to highlight that that's, that's coming up in the next uh, five, six weeks. Um, I'm hoping to get to some of those and, and be able to meet, meet you and colleagues. Um, but yeah, either online or in person, um, but, but do please let me know if you have questions around that um, and we can uh, discuss more about what's, uh, yeah, what that, what, 
what's what's relevant and how that might be a, a useful thing for you to be at. Um, a couple of longer term projects that we have that I will be sort of coming together and, and sort of one of them, which is sort of towards finishing and the other, which is just beginning. Um, so we've been working with colleagues at Trust Law um, uh, to look at the um, potential uh, for existing kind of legal mechanisms in countries. So the idea being that, you know, refugees face a lot of legal barriers in terms of accessing property. Um, and there's sort of barriers to owning or controlling land longer term. The reality is that return is quite limited. So we need those longer term solutions. And the same for IDPs, often control and ownership of land is expensive. Um, and there can be a real difficulty in, in, in IDPs getting that secure tenure and that, that, that ability to stay safely in a place for a period of time. So we thought we needed to explore the potential of things like community land trusts. You know, it's a tool that's been used with some success globally. So that's where, you know, ownership is held by a third party. Normally, that's a not-for-profit entity. It might be an NGO or some kind of trust, and they manage that land in trust. So it can be used for conservation and for housing. Um, and one of the things we were wondering is, is there potential for these things to be useful for the humanitarian context, for that displacement context? You know, currently, a lot of our toolkit is, you know, is around how do we facilitate returns? How do we support that? And of course, that is vital and important. But when people are displaced for a long period of time, are there other things that might help us um, in, in, our, in our response? So that's a piece of work that's going on in uh, Bangladesh, Colombia, Haiti, Kenya, uh, Lebanon, Nigeria, Somalia, Sudan, and Uganda. And we have partnered with um, uh, sort of law firms and, and legal actors in, the, in those countries uh, to uh, do that research and to report back. So that's something that we'll be hearing more about in the coming weeks. And then we'll be thinking about what to do with that. And, and it'd be great to uh, convene a meeting on that and discuss it and, uh, and see what, what we can do. The second project, just to mention, which is something that's beginning, is, um, is work looking at um, uh, developing sort of practice on, on the links between climate change, disaster and HLP. And that's um, uh, a project that we're just at the early stages of, of, uh, of pushing. So um, that's within NRC, but with a focus on the work of the AOR as well. And the overall aim is to identify, advocate the links between climate change and HLP with a focus on sort of durable solutions, but also uh, prevention and practical sort of implementation and we want to do that through through the cluster through the AOR um, and so if, if that's something that you think might be relevant for your context um, you know I know that for example in Somalia in Afghanistan I've had conversations with colleagues where um, the sort of impacts of climate change are really affecting some of the work you're doing so it'd be great to to hear about that more and um, something I'm really keen to do is to um, sort of develop a bit of a, a, a sort of a focus group around that. So again, I'll share a link to the, uh, the, the, the form you can complete to, um, to register interest in that, but please do also put that in the chat if, if that would be something of interest. A um, couple of last things just to mention is that um, the, we hosted with um, UN Habitat and GLTN and UNHCR uh, the launch for uh, the key messages on uh, women, land and peace. And that happened on the uh, 16th of uh, February. Um, and again, I will share that link with you um, in, the, in the newsletter so you can see, see that and watch the event. It was a fairly well attended event. There's 160 people there and it was a great, great interventions, examples of case studies of, of people putting into practice some of the, uh, the, uh, the things that we've been talking about in those key messages. So um, that would be well worth um, uh um, yeah having a look at and uh, sorry one more thing oh yes just to mention um we have the work plan for 2022 it's last year we developed a two-year work plan so for this year and last year um and there's an there's the opportunity for you to um to get involved and to say things that you would be interested in um so please do uh fill those in i'm going to put uh, links in the chat in a moment um, so that you can see see what's possible and um, yeah and it'd be great so you can have a look at all the different sort of activities that are in there there might be things that you're interested in being involved with um, and you can put put your name in there and then we can uh, look at how we can uh, work together on that so that would be um, fantastic um, 
so thank you. For, so before I move on, are there any uh, questions or uh, comments just before we uh, move on to hear from, from you? I see uh, Bretta saying it's interested in the Community Land Trust for Humanitarian Response. Yeah, good, noted. Okay, I'll take the uh, silence as a, an encouragement. Um, good, so I'm gonna now pass over to uh, Patrice, who is gonna give us a brief update from the HLP and shelter uh, perspective. Patrice, over to you. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Jim. So I will take you through like two main points about uh, tools and guidance developed during this period and also support provided to different countries. So about tools and guidance, okay, we work on HLP due diligence for shelter activities. So the main point discussed or revised, okay, were about a security of tenure and how to have a contextual approach. And also um, the point the point were about also having giving access, access to land and adequate housing and how to prevent eviction and how shelter practitioners should apply or should protect or should involve HLP issue during their activities. So my main task was to combine or to update all the revision done through uh, the last month. And the comments uh, came from all protection and shelter actors. So the first draft is completed, okay? We will have an internal revision and finally, finally we'll share it with other actors to see the next step to, to see what are the next step. Again, the shelter cluster, global cluster, shelter cluster, HLP um, AOR, work on a, like a new, a new curriculum for HLP. And the main, the main, the key, the key point developed were about how to address HLP issue in shelter operation. And again, why do we have to, to start with HLP a right protection during from emergency to durable solution and how land governance should be a, have to be have to contribute okay to protect a displaced population or affected population right and we went also through a site management and host communities a, how they deal with a HLP issues and we also work on some tools about assessment and coordination. This is the first draft and we we'll work, we'll work closely with um, shelter the protection global a, 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 the global HLP AORs and then we'll try to have, have a merge a document for the final a, tools. And about very quickly about the support provided to country office, okay? We work closely with, a, with our Fil Filipino teams, okay? To have a HLP component in the uh, advisory notes on the, what we call non-built zone, okay? This is a government policy to protect or to avoid that returnees or displaced population uh, resettle in the heavily uh, affected areas, okay? And again, we provide some support to Madagascar team, Nigeria, and so on. So this is a, an overview of what was done during the last month. Thank you. Thank you, Patrice. And of course, I should have introduced um, Patrice uh, works also with Ibere as um, HLP advisors with the Global Shelter Cluster. So uh, we work closely with them and, and they're available and always happy to support and uh, uh, yeah, listen to, to what's going on. Um, so yeah, thank you for that, Patrice. That's, that's great, really helpful. Um, so we have some minutes left now for, I'd love to hear updates from colleagues who want to share something they're working on um, something that is, yeah, it could be a challenge. It could be something that's working well. Um, maybe take, you know, one or two minutes each uh, to share an update. Um, 
as I open the floor to, to you. Evelyn, please, you go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Jim. So the update is for the HLP AOR in, in Somalia. And uh, we have some pieces of work that we're working on. So the first one is our priority for this year is to update our HLP AOR strategy. A lot changed between 2020 and 2021. So we've also realized that uh, there, are new, uh, there are new streams of work that we need to be considering in Somalia. So specifically uh, for the HLP AOR, we are updating the strategy to include natural disasters. We're also looking at uh, access to justice and rule of law and emergencies. Specifically, we have lessons from uh, the COVID-19 situation. So beyond forced evictions and tenure security that we've invested in uh, for a longer time, we are now looking at uh, investing in those new areas and, and developing new work streams as a priority for the HLPR. We're also shifting from eviction monitoring and response to more sustainable approaches to evictions. So as you know, we have uh, an eviction portal that has uh, moved from a tracker to a portal that is being used by the government and also humanitarian partners, donors, and also development partners. So we are now shifting to a, mass, a more sustainable approach. We're working with authorities, uh, government authorities, that is the local authorities where we have three eviction task forces led by the government. We are also working with the National Durable Solutions uh, Secretariat and also the Durable Solutions Units in the sub-national, at sub-national level, uh, CCCM, Shelter and Protection Cluster to come up with a robust eviction strategy that is collective and to get ownership from the authorities because we know that with a lot of durable solutions work, we need to get some sustainable approaches. So looking at the authorities, we're also looking at advocacy we are developing a paper as the HLPR on um, HLP and durable solutions. We also have some elements around uh, resilience that we are including and what implications it, that it actually has for land rights generally. Uh, the paper will also make a specific recommendations for legal and policy reform that we recognize as a gap. And lastly, we are working on a toolkit uh, that Jim, uh, you're very much aware of. We've been supported by the global HLPR to develop a toolkit on HLP and natural disasters. This toolkit um, is very short, but it is very strategic and it's very focused. It has tools, 10 tools that uh, help HLP actors to respond in natural disasters. So HLP actors are actually able to identify HLP issues prior to, during and after a natural disaster, specifically with recommendations and case studies from floods and the drought. Then also it has two manuals, uh, a, a TOT for trainers and then a manual for the participant. And uh, then that means that it builds capacity and it will be translated into Somali language. It's very generic, but to be translated into Somali. We we'll develop some uh, case studies also in Somali. It's now having going through a final review. It will soon be uh, disseminated widely, but it's just going through an internal review within the HLPR. Those are the pick up that's uh, from the HLPR in Somalia. Over to you, Jim. Thanks, Evelyn. That's great. And um, sounds like there'll be some uh, good um, things for uh, Richard and Anna to pick up on when they're thinking about Libya as well as, as you develop those um, sustainable approaches to eviction uh, response. Uh, it sounds really interesting and be great to share some of those uh, uh, things as they're developing. I think they'd be really good to, to hear. Um, OK, next, uh, go to uh, Laura Cunial, please. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is an update for a uh, Syria regional crisis, uh, not necessarily uh, an HLP AOR, uh, but we just launched this past December a, a report together with UNICR that looks at the um, HLP issue um, that the Syrian refugee hosted in Jordan, Lebanon, and Iraq are facing. Uh, and we are specifically looking at their property and their land back in Syria. And so uh, it's really the perspective of refugees who have now been abroad for uh, almost a decade in terms of uh, you know, documentation that has been lost, 
but also a level of destruction and damage in Syria, uh, uh, secondary occupation, eviction, and all the HLP violations that have been taking place in Syria. And the report also looks at um, civil documentation um, challenges, but uh, I'll put the link uh, on, on the chat because uh, uh, no, the vast majority of Syria related reports are for very limited dissemination these days, but this is actually a public report. So uh, very much uh, encouraging sharing with the members of the HLPOR. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. We'll be sure to include that in the uh, newsletter as well to make sure it's uh, shared widely. Um, Gabrielle, let's go to you in South Sudan, I believe. Okay, thank you very much, uh, colleagues, for the wonderful updates. And uh, from South Sudan, NRC through SLP Second Follow Up Group uh, is pushing for the uh, for the draft land policy, which was uh, been really delayed a lot, and it was it actually reached the parliament, the previous parliament, but it was kind of abandoned by the government. Now, under the new peace agreement, and the uh, parliament is being reconstituted, and uh, soon uh, NRC through HLP Taken Color Working Group is really working seriously to see to it that this document uh, goes back to the parliament. Good thing this time is uh, we have the backing of the Minister of Lands, Housing, and Urban Development that is also really participating with us. Uh, they have seen the importance of this document because under the peace agreement, uh, all the transitional government is charged with a uh, kind of uh, key role to adopt this document and also uh, administer uh, land administration and management during this period. Uh, so I think we are working hard on that. Then the second thing is quickly is about the women's HLP. Uh, Women HLP, the document you highlighted about like uh, women enhancing women uh, uh, land rights and peace building, also NRC, especially in the area of WOW uh, under the previous project, UN Habitat, is also working hard uh, to see to it that this uh, project uh, continues. So we are uh, using really available opportunities to advocate on the rights of women uh, in South Sudan. This is briefly what I, uh, I wanted to highlight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabrielle. Thank you for those uh, updates. And over to Fatih. Thank you, Jim. Um, just going to be really brief. I know we're tight on time. Um, in furtherance of, you mentioned the HLP help desk. So at UN Habitat GLTN, um, we've worked on finalizing the database of contacts from our side, which are a list of people who are going to be um, key contacts and resources in various different countries on HLP issues. And also in furtherance of the launch of the key messages on women, land and peace, we're also okay. developing webinars surrounding those messages. And I really actually want to appeal to everyone in the group today that if you have um, any particular need on the ground in any particular country, um, I can leave my email here. You can contact me and we can kind of work together to develop some custom made webinars and trainings, um, particularly around women's um, access to HLP and why it's important to maintain that. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for those updates. I will, um, yeah, so Fatih, if you could just share your email in the chat, that would be great in case people have those um, needs. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and yes, yeah, so that brings us to time. Uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you to the presenters we've had joining us um, for our sort of Mine Action colleagues, Roxana at the beginning, from Anna and Richard from um, uh, the Libya context. Thank you to Patrice for sharing about the shelter cluster and the work they're doing. Um, and thank you all for your uh, wonderful contributions, questions, comments, suggestions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and just want to say again, if you have um, ideas or things that you'd like to have discussed in these meetings, we have uh, another one scheduled for June. Um, so uh, please do get in touch and, and we can and organize something. I'm also really keen to, if there's particular things that are coming up that we can organize workshops around particular challenges, issues, situations, again, 
please do reach out um, and I'm, I'm really keen to have you involved. So do let me know and, and I will help make that happen. Um, but yes, thank you all for being here. And uh, if anyone can turn their camera off for a, a goodbye wave, it's always nice to see, see the faces. But otherwise, I look forward to seeing you um, in the coming months. <laughs> Thanks so much. Say goodbye. Goodbye. Cheers. Thank you.